Hey there, my name is Tom Chi, and I'm here today to talk to you about a radical experiment that I've been conducting over the past year. It's an experiment that's taken me to 13 different countries, running dozens of workshops and working with some amazing organizations. In short, that experiment was to see whether the concepts of rapid prototyping could be used to reinvent entrepreneurship and potentially all of business. So, in order for you to understand that, I'm going to give you a quick little run-through about what rapid prototyping is about so you can see what those concepts are. Now, up here is a product called Google Glass. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to see digital information overlaid on your real life and be able to stay in your real life as you, as you walk about. Three years ago, I, I, I joined Google and had the opportunity to go work on this product, but nothing existed. And I, I have just one simple question for the audience at this point, and don't shout it out if you already know the answer. But how long do you think it took to build the first working version of this experience, seeing digital information uh, on your physical world as you walk about? Any guesses? Months? Any, anything else? Three months. Three months? OK, great. Well, the actual answer is one day. And the way that it looked, is exactly right here. You may or may not know this person, just anonymous person. And um, we actually used just really basic household materials. I think actually upon seeing it, almost anybody in this room could build this. So it's a coat hanger, which allows you to, you know, hangs around your neck and the other part rests on your chest. That supports a little thing that comes out holding a plastic sheet, which allows you to see. It's the screen. And um, then there's a little laptop, which is powering a small projector so that the digital information is, is in front of you as you walk about. And this helps me highlight a couple different concepts from rapid prototyping. In rapid prototyping, it's, it's important to go as quickly as possible to get a direct experience. Because only from a direct experience, you've got to take that quickest path, do you learn the things that you need to learn from, from, from the work. And the second rule, kind of related, is that doing is the best kind of thinking. We're so used to thinking before we do a thing. So, a normal thing in a business would be to sit down and have you know, three months of planning meetings. That's why it takes months to do, actually. But if you were to sit down and start building that day, not only would you start having your plans come together, you would be able to learn what the real problems were. And, and this is what we did. Now, if these are the rules of an individual prototype, then this is the purpose of the prototyping process overall. Encapsulated in just a single sentence, the purpose of the prototyping process is to maximize your rate of learning on a difficult problem by minimizing the time to try new ideas. And what we're now going to do is we're going to see what happens when we bring the simple concept into the world of entrepreneurship to try to go change what the entrepreneurial experience is. So in the first example, we're going to examine what happens when we take the time to try new, new ideas down in the context of improving a business. So a lot of you work in business or know people that, that work in business. And you know, you'd be really lucky if, uh, if, your, if your business tried something new every three months. Or if you're very, very lucky, maybe once a month. But in this particular situation, we brought people together and we made them try a new business idea every hour. And this is what it looked like. So these numbers on the side are minutes. And within that number of minutes, they needed to come up with the idea, build a prototype, test it with people that didn't know about the prototype, and record everything that they learned. And we did this with 20 different teams. And in, uh, in an auditorium like this, actually, we broke into 20 different teams. Um, and each one of them had to do this process, not one time in a day, but four times in a day. So what happened? Well, I'm going to just do a summary because too many amazing things happened. But uh, uh, Debbie over there in the, in the, in the top left, he invented a new approach to pasteurizing milk at a small scale to be able to help rural farmers in India. This happened in one day. The, over in the, in the top right, uh, Shane was able to reinvent his product offering. It's an educational offering for green architecture and log 1,500 new sales in the same day. And probably the most amazing story is Sheikh, whose business was to grow coffee, uh, chocolate beans uh, using the labor of former child soldiers. So convert child soldiers into farmers 
he's able to produce these beans. But what he did in that day was launch a new company to take those beans, turn them into chocolate under the brand Liberation Cocoa. And he, in that same day, he also set up the website, created a board of directors, and was able to go and take orders on the website. So one week after that event, I was able to eat that chocolate. It was delicious. All right, so let's move on to another example. What happens when you reduce the time to try around raising an investment? Now, I don't know how many of you are entrepreneurs, but you can imagine what it's like to borrow money, right? So if you ask a friend for maybe $100, not a big deal. If you ask for $10,000, it starts to get a little bit iffy. But as an entrepreneur, it's not that unusual to go in there and have to raise $1 million. And because of that, it takes a long time. It usually takes three, four, five months. You have 50 meetings with investors. Maybe a handful of them are interested, and you get investment from maybe three or four. Now, what happens if we can take that time to try and bring it down dramatically? Well, the way that we did it is we completely changed the format of the investor meeting. Normally, it looks like something over here, where an entrepreneur sits across from an investor, and they ask for what they need, and they give a pitch. And like I said, it takes many, many meetings, and most of the time, the answer is no. But in this case, our meeting looked like this, where the entrepreneur, this is Jamila from Kenya, is surrounded by three investors. And their goal is not actually to figure out whether they want to invest in Jamila. Their goal that day was to, to pretend to be Jamila's board of directors. And their mission was to make Jamila's company the most investable company it could be by the end of, of that session. And not only did they do it one time, every one of the entrepreneurs had four sessions like this. So they got to meet with about 10 to 20 investors. Now, what were the results? Well, I was working with Unreasonable, and you guys had seen uh, Daniel's presentation, so you have a sense of what Unreasonable does. And in the previous year, they had tried the traditional approach. And the result, unfortunately, despite having some amazing on entrepreneurs, was 0% of the entrepreneurs during that event got either investment or serious follow-up for, uh, for conversations about investment. Using the new rapid prototyping approach, 90% did. And beyond the fact that, that we went from 0 to 90%, the way that investors felt about it were completely different. Instead of the investors being these sort of very serious gatekeepers trying to protect their money, you saw them joyful, engaged, trying to create something to improve the world. They were so happy about being able to help. And uh, I had entrepreneurs come up and tell me that they had made three months of fundraising progress in one day. So about 100 times faster. All right, last example. So what happens if you can minimize the time to try when you're serving a community? And this example comes from Aguascalientes, Mexico. So, and most of you probably have not been there, but, but there's a sizable community uh, in, near Aguascalientes which is living on fewer than $2 a day. And unlike the other sessions that I've shown you so far, in this case, we went right out and, and next to where the customers were in that community, working with them throughout this process. And what we did in this case to rapid prototype is we were based in the community center and all these houses were surrounding us and here's an example of a house. It's a little bit tough out there. But we tried a very interesting approach to iterating the business model. Instead of doing the normal MBA thing of sitting down, creating a business model, uh, doing a lot of Excel models, and you know, spending months and months uh, obsessing about it, we said, yeah, we will make a business model, but we're going to make it, and we're going to test it in 20 minutes. So as soon as the business model was drawn, the team in the community center was drawing the business model, they would call on their cell phones two teams that were out in the community. And they would ask those people, in the, uh, the teams in the community, to find the people that were represented in the business model and interview them to see if that business model made sense. Would they be willing to participate in the business model as described? I'll show you what that looks like. So here's the home team. Right here is a, 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 model, a, a business model drawing. On here is a cell phone with, on speakerphone, and they're connected with these two teams that are out in the community talking with individuals in the community. And I'll share a specific example. I think this will, this will help understand how quickly this happened. So the previous day, we had interviewed folks in the community, and we found a carpenter who was very skilled, but he, he couldn't get reliable work. 
Yeah, so that next morning when these business models were being drawn, they, you know, they came up with a business model where, well, you know, we have this carpenter, maybe what he can do is he can train some of the youth, like boys between 13 and 20 years old, how to do carpentry, and that will provide a steady stream of income. So they went back to the carpenter, talked to him about that. He was very excited because he said, oh, well, if, if you could get that to happen, my, my income would triple. It's amazing. And uh, so the, the, uh, the home team was excited, so they called the other away team, and they say, said, go find us some uh, men between 13 and 20 years old and see if they'd be interested in this class. So they found some boys hanging out on the street, talked with them, and they were kind of interested in carpentry. They might pay 10 pesos to, for a lesson in carpentry, but the boys said, you know what would be really ex exciting is if we could learn how to fix cars and motorcycles. I mean, what 15-year-old boy doesn't want to learn how to fix a car or motorcycle? So the home team said, great, now we need to find a mechanic. So they called their first away team and found a mechanic in town. And every time they called them, they only have 15 to 20 minutes to find somebody in the community that fits this role. So they found a mechanic within 20 minutes, talked to him, and said, oh, hey, if we could bring 10 boys in that would pay you 10 pesos each in order to do a, a, a lesson in how to fix cars and motorcycles uh, you know, for a couple hours, how, how would that sound to you? And he said, that's amazing. That would double my income. And I, it would be more stable for me. That would help my family so much. But, you know, actually, there's a problem. I don't have a lot of extra cars and motorcycles for them to work on. I don't even know if I can really teach this class. So the home team getting this information, they called the other away team again and said, find us people in the community that have broken cars and motorcycles in their front yard. <laughs> Ask them if it's okay to lend it for a couple weeks to get those things fixed under the guidance of an expert mechanic and their students, and so on and so forth. And you can see how every 20 minutes, every 30 minutes, the business model was adjusting and adjusting and until it became more and more real. And by the end of three hours, four different teams were doing this process, actually. Uh, at the end of three hours, on average, they had updated the business model six to eight times, and not in an arbitrary way, in a way that became so real that at the end of three hours, we had people coming in from the community ready to fill those jobs, ready to serve each other in that new way that they had never imagined before. So, oh, and the one thing I forgot to mention about this particular experiment was the majority of these teams were just college students from a local college. They weren't brilliant business people, they weren't serial entrepreneurs, they didn't have any training in business even, really. I had just taught them how to draw a business model before we started. And what I saw in action that day was almost the essence of entrepreneurship, what, what it means to truly serve a community, what it means to truly create value by people interacting with each other. So with that, in summary, we've seen three different experiments bringing rapid, entrepreneur, uh, rapid prototyping and entrepreneurship together. We have saw new businesses launched in a single day, startup fundraising speeding up by 100 times, and the creation of new opportunities for, for the poor out of nothing. And with that, I would, I would encourage the people in this audience to think about a significant problem or challenge that they see within their own lives and ask themselves the question, what would it take for me to minimize the time to try new ideas in this space so that I could maximize my rate of learning and create my own destiny. Thank you. Okay.